Welcome to the Next Gen CMO Podcast, where we sit down with seasoned CMOs and emerging talents in sales and marketing to explore the wins and occasional losses that shape today's leaders and the strategic maneuvers that can help propel you to the forefront of B2B marketing. All right, everyone, welcome to the Next Gen CMO podcast. I am super excited today because we get to welcome Wes Schaefer to our podcast. Um, I had a chance to sit on Wes's podcast, uh, The Sales Whisperer, a few weeks ago, and I love being able to turn the tables because he made me work for it, and I'm going to make him work for it today. Um, so that should be uh, we should that should be fun. Wes started The Sales Whisperer in 2006. Um, after he did uh, nine years in the Air Force, a decade in sales. Um, he's also a fellow, fellow Aggie, Texas A&M, so giggum, all of our Aggie fans. Woo. Since then, he's written a couple books. He's published over 700 podcast episodes, helped a ton of entrepreneurs in 29 countries, all across um, how to work uh, within sales or with sales, uh, with style, grace, and dignity. Fun facts about him, though I may be stealing his fun fact for the end of this episode, and he is a father of seven, he is a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, the president of his HOA. Cut so, your grass, all- pull your weeds. <laughs> I hate my HOA, so I can't wait to have that conversation. Um, I hate everything about them. Uh, if I get one more notice that my trash cans are in the wrong place on the wrong day, I'm going to lose my mind. And uh, so let's, let's uh, check it out. I, like I am making HOAs boy. great again, okay? <laughs> We're going to make a hat that's for that one. Is that Mahoa, Mahoga? Um, that's awesome. Uh, well, good. Well, welcome to the podcast, Wes. Thanks for having me. Thanks for not making me regurgitate everything you just did. It sounds much better coming from you. <laughs> well, we have, we have great folks that support us and make sure that we can uh, hit all your highlights. So cool. Well, tell us uh, tell us a little bit about the, the story of the sales whisperer. Where did that come from? What motivated you, inspired you to start that? And, and all the sort of subsequent uh, tangential work that goes with it, with books and, and consulting and all those things. Yeah, and I had the uh, either great fortune or misfortune of being recruited into high tech at the <laughs> peak of the bubble. Summer, it was the summer of 2000. We didn't know the bubble had peaked. And I got into high tech, and it was just so chaotic for years. And uh, it was just I was just hanging on. But I was constantly learning. I was still young and and motivated and uh, investing in myself. And I met a, a guy, a sales trainer, through a marketer, and loved his approach. He gave me a system to follow for sales. I was always, I did well in sales, but I worked very hard. He gave me a system and a process to follow, and so sales became more predictable. You know, because as humans. Whether you believe in like the Myers Briggs or the DISC personality or whatever, I mean the the models. There's truth in all those models. People do have certain tendencies, uh, ways that we process information, ways that we make decisions, ways that we just get along with one another. So you'll naturally click with those that are like you, but that's only about twenty five percent of the population. So yeah. learning how to recognize that and and connect easier with prospects and even your peers, your boss, your your people that work for you. You know, it's, I I was doing this naturally. I would connect with people in the company and leverage them, you know, get them on my side and not like in a manipulative way, but it's like, if you got to get stuff done, make friends, you know, Mm -hmm. be easy to work with. Like when I was selling technology, you know, they would give us demo gear. And mm-hmm. you were only supposed to have a little bit of demo gear because this stuff was expensive. And salespeople mm-hmm. are notorious for losing it, for just not keeping <laughs> track of it. You know, I mean, guys would literally lose multi-thousand dollar pieces of equipment. But I I kept a good spreadsheet. I, I kept it updated. So the demo folks back at headquarters let me have more of it. <laughs> I had way more than my fair share, right? Because I made their lives easier. And so... Yeah. It's just, it's just common sense. It's just decent, common courtesy, you know? And so I just, so having people skills, then having a sales process, it made my life easier. I made more money. 
And then through all the turmoil, it's like, if, if things are this chaotic working for somebody, it's like, it can't be any more chaotic working for myself. Right. <laughs> and, and in the process of learning marketing, I realized I was a marketer trapped in a salesman's body. You know, I was good at sales, but I was good at writing. I was, I was creating my own presentations. I was creating my own email templates. I was doing my own outreach. And so going out on my own where I had to have all of that, right? I got to market myself. I got to close the deals. I got to deliver the content. It's just, it's spilled over because I've always believed, you know, marketing is just selling in print. That's interesting, but yeah. I think if if a marketer has strong sales skills or at least an appreciation of sales and at least at least not does not despise sales <laughs> they they're better marketers you know because I don't have you studied the the old you know like David Ogilvy and Robert Collier and those folks from oh, yeah. you know the early 20th century you know those those guys were amazing. You know, and Ogilvy's famous for saying, you know, the the customer is not a moron. She is your wife. <laughs> you know, he's like, stop looking down at people. You've got to get their attention. You've got to meet them where they are. Okay, they may not understand. They may not be educated or informed on your product, but doesn't mean they're stupid. Right. So meet them where meet they them are. Meet them where they are, right? And so there's a lot of salesmanship in marketing, we've got to get their attention, good headline, mm-hmm. good image, good caption, you know, dual readership path, bold font, appropriate, you know, blah, blah, blah. So most companies, sales and marketing are at odds with one another. I think sales is at odds with everybody. <laughs> they're at odds with IT. They're at odds with the demo people. They're at odds with operations, <laughs> with support. So, you know, salespeople bring their own pain uh, upon themselves usually. <laughs> well, that's a good segue if we think about how do we how do we get away from those silos? And obviously, like I love to hire, you know, I lead marketing. I love to hire sellers into marketing because I feel like they have much better experience of what really works, right? Especially like SDRs coming into marketing. They have a good idea of like what rejection looks like, what messages are rising to the top, which ones are not, what, you know, all the things. So I love that. But there are, as you said, there's silos between them. Um, one of the things, and I'll tease you a little bit about it, is uh, that that creates silos is when sellers go and start writing their own content. So versus some of kind of staying, let's say, on brand or on message. How do you ensure that as you go, the other great quality, I think, of a seller is that entrepreneurial spirit, spirit right? Being able to come up with creative ways to go after an outbound, to find people, to get a, a good hook, to get them to listen. So how do you make sure in the world of of sales and marketing alignment, and you can be entrepreneurial in the way that you hunt um, and farm, as while still being a good steward for the brand and for the company to to be an extension of marketing. Some of this is the upper leadership's fault, right? Because they'll give different, they give conflicting incentives to sales versus marketing, different MBOs, different metrics. So. You know, if you're a leader in marketing, you've got to make sure that goals are as closely aligned as possible. Uh, and, and you've got to be selling internally as well, right? Uh, get the salespeople on your side. And while I don't, I, some salespeople will try to create their own stuff, but I don't, I don't know if that's widespread. Honestly, because most are too lazy to do it. I've always said, you know, the typical salesperson is coin operated. Yeah. All right. They want to make money. Now they they might push back on marketing, saying, Oh, you're too removed from the sale. You you're not delivering this content. You know, this this slide deck doesn't doesn't flow. You know, I I'm making my own. And that's tough. And that's where again, sales and marketing must be in alignment and it must be aligned at the top. You know, they say a fish stinks from the head down, right? Management leadership's got to set the tone and say, look, this is how we go to market. Uh, from the marketing side and from the sales side, it's like, don't, don't be messing with this stuff. This is proven to work. Go work it. And so, but I, I don't see that happening enough. I mean, I was, I just had a client, uh, the high tech uh, space, uh, 85, 90 employees, and they were struggling. And it took it took his marketing guy 
about a month to deliver a new slide deck, right? And I didn't even know they needed a new slide deck. Sales are down. Sales are struggling. I mean, it's it was literally rearranging the chairs in the Titanic. It's like, yeah. who who are we giving this slide deck to? You don't have enough. There's there's literally no sales calls happening. Yeah. And you're and you're tweaking a deck and color schemes and fonts. <laughs> I was like, and and now they've got layoffs. Yeah. You know, so you gotta. There's every, every job is the same. Every job is all about people. It's leadership. It's it's communication. Uh, it's nurturing. You know, Zig Ziglar talked about if you help enough people get what they want, you can get what you want. So mm-hmm. every job and every business is about leadership, connecting with people. And I think I think everybody loses sight of that. Yeah. Um, so just just be more of a people person and. And a lot of the problems will start to resolve themselves or, you know, the radicals, the crazies, the, the bulls in the China shop will, they'll tone it down if they feel heard and, and listened to. Yeah. I think, and some of the challenges on some of that is, I think, or what I've witnessed is, so there's a lack of understanding between like maybe a lack of empathy or understand between what sales priorities and marketing priorities. Like we are all, for example, talk about getting the right metrics in place you know, we're all aligned to the same pipeline of revenue targets. So that should be good, right? We have a single North Star. We get it to pipe. They get to bookings, but they're all related. It's the same, you know, it's all the same cascade. So all that works. The challenge is that sometimes to get to that pipeline, there are these other overarching capabilities that are not the ones who are pulling the trigger on that lead gen campaign, but somebody who's having to build that deck for that particular program or build that piece of content to run that demand gen program build that event booth to run, um, to drive our prospects to that we can then close pipeline. So there's all these things that feel far removed that I think sometimes um, I wonder if sales sort of understands that or if it, because I mean, I hope, I like to think that everything we do in marketing is in service of sales. It's just not always direct to sales. So meaning that like maybe we're working on the brand, it's so that our sellers feel super proud and empowered to represent that brand. We have people working on events so that our sellers feel proud to invite their customers to that event. We want, you know, we want great product marketing so that our our sellers feel empowered and enabled to to speak intelligently about those products. You know, like it's all in the service of sales doing their job better, but it is sometimes removed. And so I think it can create some of those those misunderstandings or gaps as to like, well, how are they spending all their time? There's just a lot of sort of physical legwork, I think, that that goes in that. So it's interesting that you talk about, um, you know, some of those things like a PowerPoint deck um, or what could be behind that. So anyway, I was just thinking about what you were saying. Okay, let's move forward on that. You have been around this space for a long time, sales and marketing. And I think, and what you're sharing now, I think is great insights today. What do you think, what do you wish you had known early in your career? Maybe in that time when it was pure chaos uh, in the tech bubble bursting early 2000s. By the way, I started my career in 99 in the tech space. Um, and yeah, I just watched the whole thing explode. And it was a great year to graduate from college because every company was hiring like crazy. Two years later, exploded. Not such a good year. But it was uh, but it was it was an interesting time. And yeah, those and that's when I went back to grad school after that. So then I, I hid from the <laughs> the chaos a little bit. Um, but tell me a little bit about uh, some of those lessons you wish you had known then or that you would have done different if you'd known them then. Oh man. I mean, I, I was younger and I was just hanging on, you know, really through those the early two thousands. It was It made me, you know, the old ad, it's kind of like you never meet your heroes, right? It's like, I'm 50, yeah. I'm 54. It's like, I'm about to have my third grandchild. And I think back when I was young and like looking at my dad and my grandfather, like, oh yeah, like when I'm older, I'll know stuff. I'm like, I don't <laughs> feel like I know anything. And like, where's the damn answer? When's the magic <laughs> secret decoder ring going to be handed to me? So I'll have all the answers. Right. Yeah. It's like we just keep figuring it out. Right. Yeah. You know, because being in sales, like back then, I mean, I had no budget, uh, but, you know, I made good friends. So the, the company was bumping along. 
and and they rolled out with this 18 wheeler so it was a demo lab on wheels Mm -hmm. and now because i had good connections just like i got more demo gear i got hold of that 18 wheeler more than anybody yeah right because i i would hustle and i set appointments uh and confirm things an 18 wheeler like full of you were telling you were selling hardware i assume so like a big truck of hardware Yes, it was a it was a mobile lab, so it was an air conditioned eighteen wheeler. I love it. I don't know if they do that anymore, but I love that. That's that's awesome just on the ground, like you're outside sales room, just hitting the pavement. This is two thousand three, two thousand four. I was living in Austin, and so I don't know if they're still there. Broadwing Communications off of uh, Capital of Texas. Yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of tech out there. Yeah, I mean, I, I brought it to them. I brought it up to a, a tech client in Dallas. Uh, Sprint was a big client of mine. So I got them, I got this, the road show up in, uh, up to Kansas, Kansas city. So, um, and that thing, that thing sold itself. Right. But I mean, I was just hustling and, and making friends. Right. So, and being younger and just being just a, a, a quota carrying sales rep, you know, I didn't, I just didn't have the power to, to change you know, at corporate, like how we were going to market, but because things were so chaotic and I was producing, they left me alone. Right. I I got kind of a wide berth because I was, I was getting deals done and not being a headache to headquarters. (laughs) You know, I say enough people helping enough people get what they want. You get what you want. Right. I I'm always telling my clients, you know, make your boss's life easier. Right. And I'm telling them, I I try to help my clients' clients. Um, So you've always got to go a couple layers deep, you know, six, what are the six steps to Kevin Bacon? All right. That's kind of two or three steps to the customer. Yeah. Um, And so it's from a marketing standpoint, right. That's, it's not necessarily a direct answer, uh, but getting back to everything is human right? Build the relationships and communicate. So in that regard, right, that that's what I learned. And that has continued to serve me yeah. in that regard. I think, you know, maybe if we tie it back into marketing now, it's like I've, I've never had a niche because people are, oh, you know, I sell to left-handed, blue-eyed, uh, albino, uh, alpaca groomers. I'm like, well, I bet you dominate that niche, you know? It's <laughs> like I, I help humans sell to humans. Yeah. And with AI being so prevalent now, you know, when you look back like at, at business, when the radio came out, we stopped being social creatures, right? Everybody went, they went home and stared at the box and the box told them that Tide gets your whites whiter, <laughs> right? And then television came out. So then you really stare at the box, you know, so you had radio, you had television, now the internet comes along and especially social media. Now we, it's almost, it's bringing a little bit of social back. People are manipulating it, but we can talk back now. But I mean, for like a hundred years, right? People, radio, newspapers, newspapers, not so much, but, but they did have an effect, you know, print, but radio, television, we stop. We stop meeting at the general store. We stop hanging out at the courthouse or town hall or the, you know center of the city and visiting and commiserating and trading stories and sharing wisdom and just yeah. building community. We made these little bitty tribes, and now AI is going to going to exacerbate that. But I yeah. think there'll be backlash. And I've been telling folks for years: do what does not scale. Okay, recognize. Uh, Because I just had this discussion on LinkedIn and on Facebook with a few folks. Because one guy was talking about how AI is going to kill low-level sales jobs. Mm -hmm. Going to make all the calls, do all this. I'm like, okay, maybe. Just like email killed direct mail, right? So the post office doesn't exist anymore because of email. How's that working out? Yeah. Right? So. Amazon resurrected them. Keep the humanity in everything that you do. You know, remember that there's a human being at the other end of that email, at the other end of this podcast, at the other end of the mailbox. You know, the the consumer is not a moron, right? Use your wife, use your husband, 
He's that bratty next door neighbor. Plays the music too loud. You know, these are real human people. Uh, and I think with COVID and, and everybody working from home, I think people are lonely right now. I think they're isolated. I'm hearing stories, you know, uh, events are coming back bigger than ever. Yeah. Um, people want to get back in person. So if you want to zig when the market zags, uh, by all means, understand AI, leverage it where you can. But I think the big power move in the next few years is getting back in person, you know, doing live events. I love your comment of do or cannot be scaled because anything that can be scaled can be automated and therefore replaced. If it can't scale, it means that you as a human are adding differentiated value. And uh, and there's some there's some job security and differentiation in that. So I think that's great. And yeah, the in-person events, I think, are a great example of all those. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, I have so many, so many thoughts um, on what you said. So a couple of things I want to respond to. Your human component, you mentioned that theme a few times. I think that's super interesting because when we think about, you know, back to this concept of sales and marketing silos, I think sometimes that part is forgotten. I think we sort of think about like, like if there's tension, it's like sales doesn't listen. And the reality is, is it sales not listening or is it one guy named Mike in sales that you're struggling with? Like, cause then it's like, okay, like I'm going to go talk to Mike about this. That's a very different action then I need 200 sellers to kind of hear what I'm talking about. It's like, hey, what can we actually, like, these, this isn't function to function. It's human to human. And when you get to that, then you're like, okay, I know Mike. Mike actually has the best intentions. He wants to be successful. He wants to sell. He's not trying to fight me. He's just not getting value out of what I'm giving him. So let me go talk to Mike and figure out how I can improve what I'm giving him so that he can be more effective. And that's different than like, oh, sales just doesn't listen. Like that's a different conversation because it's it's not just like one to one, but it is it is actual humans instead of this like sort of vague functional like conversation. Um, and I think that grounds you differently and like, oh, I want to help Mike be successful versus like, oh, sales is such a pain. Yeah. Um, so I think that's uh, pretty interesting. The other piece I wanted to say on that is just because we were talking about advice for young folks. My husband is always on my kids. He's like, all of you need to work in sales. At some point in your career, you have to work in sales. And uh, I think part of that is uh, one, because he's done sales and realized just how like, how hard it is. It's the hardest job in the world. How thick a skin you need to have, like how to take rejection, how to handle it with grace, all that kind of stuff. He's also a military guy like you. And I think I always love hiring military guys process oriented, operationally driven, and kind of like repeatable playbooks and stuff like you talked about. And so the other night, about two weeks ago, one of my son, my son is 16, his quarterback, um, so he's a running back, his quarterback uh, on the team, uh, 17 year older, came over to the house and he pitched us on a set of Cutco knives. Oh, <laughs> he yeah, was so huh? Yeah. And I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to play this out. And I made Van, my son sit in the thing. I'm like, this is going to be weird. Like his quarterback is pitching to his running back's family. Like talking to a peer is different than a stranger, right? Or talking to like some, like a friend. And he sat down and I was blown away. This kid, by the end, of course, we bought a whole new set of, of Cutco nines. Like we couldn't say no, but it was such an impressive thing to have a 17 year old kid stand up in front of us speak to the value prop, make it engaging, like ask us, like do a discovery with us, find out what our pain points were, do an evaluation of our current knives and how dull they had become after 17 he years. He cut the leather? He cut the rope. Rope. Yeah. Rope. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. He did cut the leather. You're right. He cut through and then he stacked the leather to show he could cut through yeah. the whole stack. Yeah, you're right. Yes. He did all that. He probably made a deck on the sales at some point, but it was just, but after he left, like, I'm thinking, first I was like, this is going to be super awkward. We're going to just do him a favor and do this presentation so he can practice. And then afterwards we were like, I am so impressed. Every young person to like, look an adult in the eye, have this conversation, probably selling to somebody in our case for sure. But um, in general, selling to somebody who's older than you, somebody who's more experienced than you, somebody who may have a thousand other things to do besides spend that 30 minutes with you. Um, but I was blown away and I was like, man, I want every young person to have to do cold call sales pitches like that at some point. Like, I feel like this guy is now going to be able to ask any girl out that he wants to ask out. He's going to be able to apply for any job he wants because he's got confidence that comes from just cold selling. 
Um, so anyway, I don't, I don't know if that was with your, your past at all. Yeah. Well, look, I've got five daughters and I'm, I'm literally working on a book called please date my daughters. I'll, I'll introduce you to the sales guy. He was awesome. <laughs> Who keeps up oh, there. There's a daughter calling me now. I got to learn to turn that off. Um, <laughs> you know, but I, five daughters and they don't get asked out. Okay. And I, I mean, I can zoom in, but I mean, they're all good looking. I mean, my oldest, <laughs> my, my oldest married the second boy she dated. Uh, the other four, now one is 10 years old. So, okay. She's, she's not on the market. The other three, I mean, 22, 19 and 16, they, they go with girlfriends to prom and, and yeah. homecoming. That's like, generation. it's crazy. People. Yeah. They, they, nobody has charisma. Yeah. And that, I think that goes, part of it is COVID. Part of it is uh, the, the gaming life and, and whatnot and the addiction to devices. But so that's what I'm saying. Zig when the world zags. They know how to have that face-to-face date, right? They like, don't. So, yeah. so can you work? So from a marketing standpoint, we must enter the conversation going on in the mind of the prospect. So how do we connect with somebody in that realm? How do we hand over that lead? to the sales team and is the sales team trained well enough to go through this and you know when i was in sales as an employee i hated role playing because now i understand the role playing was always terrible okay i do a lot of role playing in my training but i let the sales people fight me i'm like i'm not going to i'm not going to tell you how to do this I'm not showing up with the, with the playbook and just handing it to you and say, you know, become a robot, become a parrot of me. Mike, tell me what's going on. Okay. That, that's an issue. Okay. Here's how to handle it. Do you like that? Yeah. Can you do that? Oh uh, yeah. Is it honest? Yeah. Does it feel right? Yeah. Okay. Then that's how you will do it from now on. Yeah. Right. Because, but then the other problem is sales managers have never had that training either. Most salespeople have not had sales training and most sales managers have not had sales management training. Okay. They just were grinding it out. They figured it out. Either they were greedy or hungry had the back against the wall, had a family to feed. So they just put in long hours and they made their numbers. Oh, congratulations. You're now the boss. Mm -hmm. You know, well, we got sales training. No, usually it's the, it's the operations department or the marketing department get together put a deck together and go, hey, look, look at these glasses. They're black. They're uh, plastic. Uh, they weigh certain grams and scratch resistant. Go sell them. How? To who? Yeah. Right? So they haven't had sales training. And now that you promote the, the leader of the pack. And what, what made that leader successful? Aggressive, lone wolf, competitive, you know, short-tempered, goal-oriented, you know, task-oriented. And now they've got to lead a team. And now they're going to be at odds with marketing. So you see, it's it's a people issue. It's always a people issue. Yeah. You know? And so the, you got you to gotta get both sides working together. But, you know, getting back to that, I mean, nobody has charisma. Nobody. I, look, I'm working with another tech firm right now. They're hitting me up. They're inside sales team. They sell software. Software as a service. They don't get on Zoom calls. And demonstrate the product with their videos on. You know, I think I think companies have put too many layers. So I'm stepping up and I'm saying, direct the leads to me. Straight, skip SDRs, skip BDRs. They will come right to me. We will record it. I will sell these people for you for a week. We will record everything. And then we'll have the salespeople do it. And so they're like, oh, holy crap, you know. But we, we there's so all these layers. Every we're just I more silos, silos within silos, cubicles within cubicles, uh, rooms within apartments within buildings. I mean, yeah. bring people together. Prospect has a question, right to sales. Right? Let's let's cut the crap. I'm you know t- tell people. 2004, I was with that tech company. 2004, I started. I always remember. So I've been using Apple products for 20 years now computers right i was using ipods before that and i keep paying for apple products people are, oh they're overpriced blah, blah blah like but when i have a problem i call and a human answers the phone and helps me immediately yeah okay we sat on hold for an hour for frontier to help us with our internet hello <laughs> an hour 
you know, and they're using overseas reps. Yeah. So they've outsourced this. They've lowered their, their, their cost of goods sold, right, dramatically. And I still have to wait an hour? What? Like, I will pay more money. Just get me help, right? So it goes back to the human thing. Who, whoever can be more human. I just, you know what I did yesterday? I wrote about a 3,000 character rant on the alarm company that my HOA just fired after many, many years because they weren't human. They took our money, wouldn't respond. Any issue, two-week service call. Two weeks early, we pay you $47,000 for an alarm system that's not working properly. You can't answer the phone. And it take, I... the owner won't get back to me. He won't come to a board meeting to address this in person, human to human. And it takes two weeks for any service call. So I went to law. So we, we, we terminated him. Yeah. He turned everything off. So he didn't transfer things properly to the, to the next agent, you know, that, that took over. So when I went to log into something, that reminds me, I got to call that company today. <laughs> so I had the time to go on Yelp and Facebook and Angie's List and give them a one-star review. Mm -hmm. That's how I met, because I've spent, I've spent 60 hours in the last three months trying to resolve their stuff. And I'm a volunteer. I'm not paid for this. Yeah. So this guy lost a contract. And now, you know, I think it was Mark Twain said, I think it was Mark Twain. I said, don't, don't get in a fight with, with someone who, who buys ink by the barrel. <laughs> you know, I, I can write a little bit and I can disseminate it far and wide, very quickly, far faster than this guy can respond. Absolutely. Uh, and Absolutely. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Right. But this guy made me so mad because he didn't treat me like a human. Yeah. Well, tell me this. So. So there's a study that came out recently, uh, and I'd love your opinion on this because I think it's it's one of the battles marketing is having. It's probably what's driven all those layers you've talked about with SDRs and BDRs and Zoom and cameras and everything else is, uh, and I may have mentioned this on your podcast, I can't remember, is that the average age of B2B buyers is, or not the age, is they were born after 1982 or something, the average B2B buyer, which means they are in their 30s. They're millennials. So those are the people now that are making buying decisions in B2B. With that group who has grown up, like, I feel like, you know, I'm sort of the last generation maybe that had, that's, that's seen the before and the after of this tech evolution, right? Because I, like, I didn't get a cell phone until I was 23 years old, graduated from college, except for the car phone for eight bucks a minute. I was but, almost 30 before I got a cell phone. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah I mean, and so I had like this, like, my childhood didn't have iPads and my childhood didn't have cell phones. My childhood didn't have any of those things. Um, and I think I got a TiVo in grad school. Like that was like a big, big tech, you know? Um, but so there was like this window before and after. And, but now this group that's making buying decisions only knows the sort of like after of, of phones, right. And digital and texting instead of calling, like they, like, the people making buying decisions never had to like wrap the long power like phone cord and go into the laundry room to take a phone call so their parents wouldn't hear. They didn't have that. People just texted them directly or called them directly in their own room or whatever it was. And so now those people are making buying decisions. Those people aren't always like they're going to do a lot of research and a lot of uh, dark, uh, you know, research, intelligence, whatever, before they ever engage. And when they engage, they don't, they're not quite really ready to talk to a human. So there's a lot of ghosting that happens because they're just kind of operating anonymously for a long time to get all the information until they're ready to buy. It makes it really difficult for sellers, really difficult for that human connection. How do you think about like how sales should evolve or marketing should evolve when folks are all going to be either anonymous, incognito, or just digital only and not, not a face-to-face, -face, not a phone call, um, maybe not ready for any of that, like product tours online versus like a live demo. Like, how do you think that's going to change or how should it not change based on sort of going the, the zing and the zag? Maybe it shouldn't change. Well, it has changed. And look, when the internet came about, it changed the game. It salespeople were no longer the gatekeepers of the knowledge, right? If you wanted to go buy a car, you had to go down to the lot and start haggling. Now, you know, for the last 20 plus years, you can, 
You can order the invoice online and you know, you can know the exact cost. You can do your research. A lot of times, and this has been true now for a couple of decades, a motivated buyer can and will be and often is more or better informed on one particular item in your inventory than you are. Okay, because they study. Uh, and so, but, so b- before that, the salesperson had to educate and inform. And now I think the salesperson's role is to is more to confirm that the buyer is on the right path, um, give them the confidence to go ahead and move forward. Um, and so it's, it's still sales. Uh, it's just a different format. And so marketing, you know, meet them where they are. Marketing has to now put out more content, better content, more relevant content, enter the conversation going on in the mind of the prospect. Uh, top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel. Uh, if if somebody can truly buy uh, a complex solution on their own, um, give them that path. Okay, um, and and let's see how it works. Let's see how it goes. But they should always be. A, a way, you know, for that prospect to bail out, if you will, right? And say, okay, I need help. I got to talk to somebody. And you better, you better be able to talk to them right now. Super fast. You know, not days and weeks later. Um, you know, one of these, um, so with this alarm system at our HOA, you know, there's four different components, three of them, three different GUIs. Uh, none of them synchronized talking to one another. Uh, one of the two types of cameras, one of them is are kind of smart cameras. The vendor they gave us does not answer their phone. Their support team does. Their support has been good, uh, but their sales d- does not answer the phone. Uh, so guess who's getting my next one-star review? One is actually there. One is actually there. Yeah. So it's like, I've got questions. I, yeah. and I'm a paying customer. And can't talk to anybody at the home office for support on on this issue, yeah. you know. So, um, so just understand sales and marketing's role now. But yeah, I and some people say, "Oh, our stuff is too complex. They're going to have to talk to a, one of our sales reps." For 70, 80, 90 percent of your customers, maybe that's true. But some just might buy. Ones out there, yeah. You know, the, the old 80-20 rule, you know, they talk about, you know, take whatever you sell and add a zero to it, right? So let's say you've got a $100 training package, and and so that's what you start with. If you add a zero to that, 20% of your existing customers will buy that will buy that $1,000 solution, hmm. Okay. Make it ten thousand, and twenty percent of that twenty percent will buy it. Hmm. You know, so yeah. people will pay for ex- experiences and exclusivity. Yeah. Like, why did Apple come out with the gold? You know, Hermes Apple Watch. Yeah. It was like what eighteen thousand dollars or something crazy, right? But people pay for it. Not pay everybody. For it. It's not meant to be for everybody. It's anchoring, what they call like a red herring, whatever. So it it helps people justify. But, you know, Elon Musk was smart. When he came out with Tesla, because most people are like, let's go out with something small and affordable and we'll work up. He came out with the Roadster, the most expensive Tesla he's ever made. Yeah. And that funded the, the S. Yeah. And then the S funded the three. Hmm. He went from high to low. Okay, so which is a lot easier, right? As somebody like it's hard to be a value brand to become a premium. It's easier to become a premium and then yes, introduce a value line for sure. But you know, go ahead and build out the steps. Say, what if? Yeah, we got a million dollar solution. What if somebody could go through the entire funnel on their own, educate themselves, and send us a PO? Yeah, you know, I. <laughs> so I've sold software for 
for many years on, on my own, you know, as an affiliate and reseller. And, and one of them, golly, years ago. So I, uh, th- there was a setup fee for this one particular CRM. It was a couple thousand dollars and like $300 a month. And I was one of their top resellers. I'd sell 80 or 90 new accounts a year on my own. And, and I'd done it for years. And, but I set up a buy now link. Mm. So you could just go buy the software from me and, and then I would get it set up for you. So I was driving to Phoenix to meet with this company, one of their conferences. I answer my phone. It's a woman. She says, hey, when do when do we get started? I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah, the software. Like, how, what's my login? Like, what are you talking about? Yeah. And so while I'm driving, I got I to gotta look on my phone. There's an order for $2,000. She paid the setup. And I was like, oh, man. Like, I'll be right there. See you tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Well, it was like, I mean, she was in another state. I was like, hey, as soon as I get where I'm going, I, I, I'll get you logged in. Right. But. And that happened twice. I mean, I've sold probably 800 accounts maybe over all the years. And but twice, somebody bought everything on their own. Yeah. Figured I'd buy it first and then you can teach me how to use it later. <laughs> so, oh, so give that, make that an option, you know? And if nothing else, even if you don't truly go through with it, it's a good exercise. Like, what if? What can we get them all the way to legal? Yeah. Then we meet, confirm, okay. Try yeah. that, right? It makes marketing get sharper. It makes them work with sales. Like, what is the what is this next step? What are the objections? Where are the typical roadblocks? Because my dirty little secret in sales is that I hate objections. I hate old school, high pressure tactics, tie downs, alternative choice, Ben Franklin clothes, like whatever. That's ugh. so I want to anticipate, just like jujitsu, right? I I've trained enough. I know where you're going. I see a certain grip. I see a posture. Okay. I know where this is going. Yeah. Can I get there half a second before you try to get me there to throw off the rhythm, throw off the leverage? Now I'm in, in control. I don't, you know, I'm like I said, I'm 54. I, our instructor pairs up everybody just how he sees fit. So I'm fighting 25, 30 year olds, you know. I'm 235. We got guys 260, 280. I can't go toe to toe with those guys. Gotta be smarter. Gotta be smarter. Right? So I'll, you know, Confucius, or not Art of War. Why am I drawing a blank? Because I'm getting old. Sun Tzu, Art of War. Yeah. You know, if you're strong, act weak. If you're weak, act strong. Right? So I'm like, oh, oh, woe is me. Don't don't go too hard on me. And they'll lunge. I'll move. I'm like, ah, now I got you. And I'm like, I can't <laughs> believe you fell for that again, dude. So. <laughs> You've got to use their momentum against them, yeah. right? So, and use it for them. So understand where's the sale going? Where are the objections coming up? Can we alleviate them? What can we do to make this so much easier? Yeah. That's why I say great marketing is just selling in print. Hmm. You know, take away the objections. Now, I tell people all the time, a great salesperson, their job is to ask questions that the prospect cannot answer, okay? And people are like, what the hell are you talking about? Say, well, think about it. If my elbow hurts, okay, well, I'm going to ask a friend. I'm going to Google it. I'm going to go to the chiropractor. Oh, okay. Is it inflammation? Did I fall and hit it? Was it tweaked? No, 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 no. Once I can't find the answers, now I'm calling my doctor and making an appointment. And you want to be that doctor? I want to be that doctor, yeah. right? But- I tell all my clients, I've done this for years. You know, I have my frequently asked questions, but I also have my should ask questions. The should ask questions are what the prospect doesn't even know they don't know. So if I can ask a question that A, you don't know the answer to, B, you haven't even thought to ask, and yeah. then C, I already have the answer to that question. They're like, well, this guy's a value right here. Yeah. I, I need to keep an eye on this person. This person, okay, they're different. Yeah. You know, but too few people do that. Yeah. You know, and so that's where marketing can come in. Do you have a should ask question on your website? Everybody has FAQs. We were founded in 1987. Our founder worked in a garage and had a vision and got a loan from his parents. Okay. Yawn. Yeah. That's all about you. Yeah. What's in it for me? Right. So look at that. We get right back to the human part of things. Yeah. (laughs) I'm so (laughs) I don't know with that. I'm probably going to wrap us up a little bit. 
Tell me, uh, before we go, just a fun fact about yourself. I know we already talked about your seven kids and your third grandkid on the way and your uh... mother-in-law calling good grief. My, well, my <laughs> wife's gone. My wife's on a five day, six day girls trip. So I don't, I shouldn't have even scheduled this. I'm losing my mind. Okay. I'm not, I'm not on my A game. All right. So cut me some slack. <laughs> um, you better so leave yeah, all that in too. None of this editing stuff. Come on, be human. No, no, we're taking you raw. This is this is called you <laughs> real, be authentic. I'll take it all day long. Uh, but anything else you want the team to know, or any fun fact about you that you want to share with the with our oh, listeners? Oh, you hit a lot of the facts. Uh, what does the team? What do they want to know? I don't know. Tell me this: uh, When did? Uh, how did you start in jujitsu? What made you do that? A friend, he had started, and um, I think he had been training a few months. And once you start training, like they say, how do how do you know when a vegan, a CrossFitter, or a, a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner walks into your uh, walks into the bar? Oh. They tell you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so I mean, so you get uh, you just get bit with the bug, right? And you just love it. And so so Ray had started, and um, next thing I know, like he, literally for for six months, he nagged me to come train. I'm like, okay, fine, dude. Like if it'll shut you up. So I went and it, it was so hard. There was literally a guy he's, he's 72 now and just got his black belt. Wow. Well, he's 74. Now I guess black about two years ago at 72. He started at 62. He's 165 pounds. I'm 235. Wow. He, he got on to me and I couldn't get him off of me. And I'm like, Okay, this is either magic voodoo, or I, I'm going to be embarrassed and never admit that I showed up, or I got to figure out what this guy's doing. Yeah. So I just just dove in. That's awesome. Yeah, I just saw a friend of mine on Facebook. Her husband and son were doing some uh, jujitsu competition or camp or something yep. in uh, Iceland uh, last week, and I was like, "Oh, that sounds pretty awesome. Seems like a good reason to go to Iceland if you're into jujitsu." Yeah. Um, yeah. Fun times. So we train it everywhere. That's right. Well, Wes, it has been a pleasure. Thank you for giving us the mind of the seller. Thank you for keeping it real and human to human talk. And thanks for helping us bridge the gap between sellers and marketers um, and giving some practical advice. So um, it was great to have you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Awesome. And thanks everybody for listening to our uh, Next Gen CMO podcast. We'll see you next time. <laughs>